Good evening, and welcome to Views with Joyce Waddell. I want to thank you for joining us this evening. We have a very interesting show for you. We're going to be talking about voter rights in North Carolina and what it means when it comes to our freedoms, our responsibilities, and the liberties that we have as voters. We have two young ladies who are studying political science and working very actively to get people registered, to educate people, and to let citizens know about their rights as voters. We have Joy, who's a student at Johnson C. Smith, and Maisha, who's also a student at UNCC, and they're going to share some of the work that they have been doing, hard work, to let people know that they have a right to educate people about what those rights are and to make sure that we take advantage of our rights. So welcome, Maisha. Thank you, Thank you for having us. And welcome, Joy. Thank you. Now, Joy, y'all, you've been working very hard with the Voter Rights Act. What is the Voter Rights Act? The Voter Rights Act pretty much is, um, what we're doing is there are bills that are currently being processed, which would endanger and disenfranchise many to, I guess, vote. And it would, it would be more difficult for certain people, certain demographics to vote. And we're trying to make sure that those bills are not being passed. And Maisha, what are you doing so that you're, help, you're making sure that these bills are not passed, that these certain groups of people are not disenfranchised? Well, Joyce and I have both written letters to the editor. We've written letters to Charlotte Observer. We've written to Charlotte Post. And we're trying to get our voices heard. But aside from that, we're also informing the public of these bills because a lot of people aren't aware of the exact effects that these bills will have on everyone. And so what we've done is we've created this program called the One Stop Tour this summer where we go to places like Asheville and hold private screenings uh, in, of movies in um, Charlotte and we try to inform the public of what these bills entail and we also hold programs and meetings where we talk to the public to um, rally them up to go to Raleigh and talk to legislators or write letters to the editor or call Beth Perdue and tell her governor please veto this bill. Now you say you go to you hold private screenings what kind of private screenings do you hold? Well, we show documentaries of films that are going to be affecting um, the issues that are affecting candidates right now. So we have like money such as, um, or films such as Big Bad Money in Politics, which is a documentary called Inside Job. And we inform people how candidates are being affected because of bad money in politics and how in that way these bills that are coming into con um, state senate, state house right now are because these candidates were put into position. And these bills are actually designed by someone, not just the people's interest in heart, but it's the party's interest. So we try to, we're a nonpartisan organization, so we don't hold any party's interest, we hold the people's interest. And that's why we believe that it's by, for, and of the people, and everyone needs to be represented in government. So these bills that are being passed, if certain demographics aren't able to vote because of these bills, their interests are not being represented. Now, you're working all over North Carolina, but you're, you're stationed here in Charlotte. So is your emphasis here in Charlotte because it's the largest city and you probably have the largest voting population here? Or is someone else doing what you do in other parts of the state? Well, Democracy in North Carolina is an organization that um, they're actually stationed in Durham, but they have like sub places like we have one in Charlotte, there's another in Greenville, and there's one in Durham. Right now, other um, interns like ourselves, ourselves are put in these places to actually do what we're doing. We have just actually been stationed in Charlotte because we live around here. Okay, so Democracy North Carolina is a, a station in Durham, the headquartered in Durham, but you are working here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. So you're concentrating on the Charlotte citizens, the Charlotte population. Um, do you know how many people voted la uh, in the last election? I am not sure. Do you sure. have any idea? Well, we know that for Sunday voting, which um, this bill will be trying to take away, 37,000 people voted. We also know that North Carolina um, was the, the candidate that won the 2008 election won because 15,000 of the votes from North Carolina, right? 
So that means if you take away those 37,000 votes from Sunday voting, you can understand the mathematics right there. Um, we know that about uh, 200,000 people all voted in uh, um, early voting. So taking away these essential days in voting is really going to hurt the population when they go to vote. Now, in the last presidential election, we had about how many, and how many people did we have voting in, in Charlotte? Did the last. Now we have a big election again in 2012. 2008 was one of the largest. Do you know how many people voted then? I am not sure how many voted. I'm sorry. You don't know. You, you, you don't know how many voted, but you know, as you look at now the population that you're looking at here in Charlotte and who who you're targeting, and the people that you're kind of trying to reach. So you're looking at those people who voted on Sunday? Are you looking at everybody? Yes. We are. We're looking but at But Sunday, like, we are about looking at everyone, but I know certain people who voted at certain times makes a difference because they would be, have a harder time voting in the next election. Like Sunday voters were focused on because Sunday voting is going to be eliminated. And, um, is, it go, is the bill to eliminate it totally? Mm -hmm. Completely? Yes. 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 Well, what happened in the years prior when we did not have Sunday voting? Because we haven't always had it. We haven't. Actually, it was a new concept that has been established recently. And it worked. It did. It was called Souls to Polls. And it made a difference. It did make a difference. But well, what happened when we didn't have it? We didn't, uh, was our turnout as well? Well, we fought to get it, and we had it for a little while, and it was a success. But as of now, because it's eliminated, we're afraid that it may like hurt people who did get a chance to vote in this last election on that Sunday. Like in the coming elections, people who can only like vote on Sunday, like people who drive their elder parent, their older parents, they only get one chance to like vote on Sunday because people who are in the working class can only spare to drive their parent on that Sunday afternoon and because Sunday voting would be eliminated, they and their parent would be uh, affected. Artists, we're continuing to talk with Joyce, a student at Johnson C. Smith, and Maisha, a student at University of North Carolina here in Charlotte. They are working diligently here in Charlotte to educate voters and to get strength so that bills in the Senate and in the House will not be used to disenfranchise voters. They're working with voters' rights. And so we've titled our program, Voters' Rights. And that's the program that we're talking about tonight. As a voter, we have to be cognizant. We have to be aware of voting times, voting hours, because it does make a difference. Often people don't want to stand in long lines, and often they will not stand in long lines for various reasons. So if this bill is defeated, or if the bill is passed, What's plan B? What's your next plan? Well, are I you optimistic? We are actually. Um, we we decide that if it does get passed, we're going to do everything we can to still register voters, because even though people are going to be less, you know, willing to vote, we figure if they can vote, like new voters, if they are registered they may get this chance and they may actually try and go the extra mile and vote. It's still like our goal to have everyone's, everyone to be um, participating in these polls. So what we're going to try and do is like try and get as many people to vote as we can. Even though it is a setback, we are still going to be trying to move forward. So we're looking at three things. We're looking at eliminating the bill. Is, to, is this one bill, the bill to eliminate Sunday voting? The bill to cut back on the hours of early and days of, voting. And days of early voting. Mm -hmm. Those are two things. And what's the third one? The photo ID bill. Okay, the photo ID bill. Let's talk about that. Um, right now, you have to provide identifications if asked when you read when you go to the polls to vote. So, what will the photo ID bill do? Well, right now. The first time you vote, you have to show your identification with the photo, and then after that, you don't. Now, it, you have to do it every single time, which 
and its essence doesn't sound as bad. But then you have people who take an elderly woman who hasn't driven for a couple years, so she doesn't have a government-issued ID that's a photo ID that she's needed to update. She doesn't have someone to take her to DMV because that's a long day to wait and that's a ride that she cannot take herself because she doesn't have an updated license. So when she goes to vote, she, prior to this, she would have been able to go and vote because she's done this for 50 years. But suddenly, she can't because she doesn't have an updated government-issued ID. This is... Must the ID be a government-issued? Yes. So that means it has to be a driver's license. What other, or what other kinds of government-issued IDs do you have with a picture of it? Exactly. Is that the only one? <laughs> Well, I mean, you have a hunting license, or you have a picture thing. You have to have, picture on, you have to have your picture on the hunter's license. You can. Um, there are certain states that require that. So there's obscure amounts of IDs, but really the um, basic one, you could say, would be the driver's license, because we all have some. And that could be the argument from the other side, is that, well, everyone has a driver's license. But everyone doesn't have a driver's license in this state, because if you're an out-of-state student like Joyce's, you don't have an in a North Carolina driver's license, or if you are an elderly woman, then your driver's license probably expired a couple of years ago, but you haven't had the need to renew it. So why are we hurting these people? That's, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very interesting that it has to be a uh, government-issued ID with a photo. Does it go on to say, the bill go on to say that it must have a photo? Yes. That's it's photo ID. Yeah, <laughs> that's, the, that's why we're so upset, because it's this photo ID. Now, how likely is that to pass? Very, very, likely. Very, very likely. likely. Very likely. And so the efforts that you have been involved in now, you've gone to, have you gone to churches? You've gone to any place that you see large groups of people? Have you gone to homeless shelters, too? Yes, yeah, so we're actually working with Homeless Helping the Homeless and trying, trying to get our word out through them. We have even worked with Greenpeace. We've worked, we're trying to work with any organization that we can, and we're meeting with any organization that we can to get the this. word out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Audience, we'll continue to talk about voters' rights, and these are rights given to citizens as a result of being a citizen of the United States. And it's a constitutional right. But we're going to pause for a moment, and we're going to come back and talk about how you, as one, can make a difference in what happens. And we're going to go to some music that was played here in the studio a little while ago when we had another guest, and he played music for us and for you in the audience. So we're going to flash back on that now. their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Mm. So stay in love. It's all about love. Lord I'm in love with you, Lord, I'm in love, Lord, I'm in love with you, and the woman you promised me, and the woman you promised me and the woman you promised me now listen and the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone I will make him and help me for him Who so findeth a wife 
find this a good thing and obtain his favor of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Faith and trust I have in you. You won't let me die. I remember what you done for me when no one was around I had to hold on through some stormy days and lonely nights now you've blessed me with the beautiful 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 It was worth the wait, it took some time. I belong to you, and you are mine. You're so beautiful, you're so beautiful. Tell your wife, says she's, tell her, say, you're beautiful. Tell her right now, say, you're beautiful. Yeah. That's how dedicated we are. <laughs> Because oh, and as we continue to talk with Joy and Maisha, as we talk about voting rights, and as we talk about how you as one person can make a difference, and you can make a difference by educating, by helping your neighbors, your friends, and just spreading the word about voting. Um, how old those in North Carolina and Charlotte a person has to be in order to be able to vote? They have to be 18 years old, but you can register if you're 17 or 17 and a half. And you can be able to vote if you're going to be 18 by the voting day. Like, you can, re you can re vote early at the age of 17 if you're going to be 18 by voting day. Now, what, ha what, what happens when one person can make a difference? And how can one person make a difference when it comes to voter registration, when it comes to helping defeat these bills that are currently disenfranchising? voters? Well, what we're asking people to do is call Governor Purdue, which is the governor of um, North Carolina, and we're asking them to tell her to veto these bills that are going to hurt a lot of people in North Carolina. I mean, it's going to disenfranchise many from not one demograph, but like a lot of different people. So that's what one person can do, and that's how one person can make a difference because often people will say, you know, I'm just one, I'm just one voter. And what some of the other things they can do is just as one individual where they don't have to go and get a group of people. They can write letters to the editor and get their editors to realize, of their newspaper to realize what's going on and then write articles and inform the public about it. They can also um, tell their friends about it because a lot of people in general are just not aware of these bills and you can call your legislators so if your representatives call them and let them know that you want them to veto these bills. Now you were writing letters to the editor and sometimes it's not easy to get them published. Have you seen any of yours being published yet? We personally haven't but other interns in Democracy North Carolina who are situated in Greenville and Winston-Salem have. Because Charlotte Observer is a bigger paper it's harder to get your words published but if you keep writing and if we all collectively write to these editors, then they will see that 
the public in general is passionate about it. It's not just us because we're associ associated with a certain organization, or it's not just young people. It's if everyone is a collective, we speak out, then they're going to have to give in and publish. Now, this last election in 2008, you had more young people, more college students voting than any other time in history. So we think about the voter bills that we're talking about, the ID bill and the, what's the other one? The elimination of Sunday voting. And the, the elimination and the early voting. We think about those three, but the elimination, how do you think that will affect the younger people who are so instrumental and in being actively involved in making a difference in 2008? Well, let's look at the reduction of hours and days in early voting. If we do that, what happens is, say... It's if, not to reduce it completely, it's just a reduction in days. Exactly, and hours in the day. So instead of, say, doing 8 to 6, they'll do 10 to 4. Who is going to vote in 10 to 4? We people have classes. People who are in classes, people who have work, you know, people who cannot so, make it. So suddenly you're making sure that the time that there is to vote is the time that I, our students in general are going to be busy. That's going to hurt student turnout. Sunday voting, let's take that away. Well, the weekend is the one time everyone, nobody has classes on Sunday. Some people have Saturday classes. Sunday classes, nobody has Sunday classes. So Sunday's a day I could go vote, but then now I'm not going to be able to. So those two in itself is hurting 18 to 29 demographic. And that's just students. We're not even taking into account the elderly or minorities. Plus college students don't always have rides not all of us have cars. Now, don't you have on your campus a voting polling place? You have it on your campus, don't you, at UNCC? Don't yes. you have a place where you vote, can vote? You don't have to go any place. Not for the state election. Not for early voting you didn't? You didn't have a polling place on your campus? Well, I wasn't at UNCC when the national election happened, but for state election, you, we did not have a uh, voting poll at our, on our campus. You did at Johnson C. Smith. At one time, didn't you? I'm sure at one time, but we're just now becoming juniors, so we haven't been like on the campus. Like when you weren't there, 2008. No, no, no. ma'am. No, ma'am. So you don't. Okay, so you don't know what happened then. Mm -hmm. no. But what this, as Joyce said, that we don't have cars, or if we do have cars, gas money, and then you still it's cannot. Not conven it's, it's not, not convenient. It's not convenient at all. <laughs> it's going back to, you're turning back the clock about 20 years ago. Exactly. When it was very difficult to vote 20 years ago, you had to stand in long lines, uh, you had to read a portion of the Constitution, make sure that you understood it, and you had to show multiple identifications. So it's kind of like turning back the clock, isn't it? Yeah, we're trying to go forward, not backward, as we think. Mm -hmm. And so are you educating? And another thing that they were doing that will help is go to high schools or be able to see high school students and register them because a lot of them are 18. Are you focusing on that group too? We are actually. We are talking to or we are playing talk to Boy Scouts because a lot of the 16 to 18 age because you can actually register at 16 if you want to but you can't vote till you're 18 obviously. So we're informing them about this and we're trying to talk to high school students and then college students and making them realize how important it is to vote and that their vote can make a difference. Now you have a very interesting internship, don't you? Yes, we do. <laughs> and it keeps you very busy, doesn't it? Oh, very, very busy. <laughs> this is almost like a job, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it change your mind about your future as college students? Um, what it does do is, because I wasn't as active a uh, person in like politics. Like I didn't really, I didn't really think much of you know state politics. You know more so the national politics. Of course, everyone was going bonkers when Obama was going to become president. And everyone decided they wanted to go vote, things like that. But state politics are important too because things they differ from state to state. Um, as I grow older, I'm realizing that. I have to be involved, like I have to know these things and the more informed the better because if I don't want something, because the people who are elected on the state level, they have, to, they should be listening to 
you know, local people. They should be listening to the rights of what people want. So if I'm not informed, I can't tell them what I want. And I think everybody should know that. And everyone should be informed because it's really what's going on, you know, on their local level. So what you're looking at now, when we look at the voter ID bill, that will also take effect and have effect on what we do locally, will it? In Charlotte, in our city? Politically? Yes. Well, any election it's going to have effect on. So even though we, we're going to be voting for city council people, that will have an effect on that too? You still got to show the ID, the same thing? Yeah, because it's elections. That's elections total, total in the state of North yeah. Carolina. So it's going to affect any kind of election, public election process. Yes. And so as we think about that and as you think about the people that you're talking to, what proactive measures do you think they should be taking just, just in case as they prepare themselves? Well, the first thing to do is if we're going to be taking a proactive measure is to make sure that your ID is updated and that um, if you have parents who are older and who can't, don't have a ride to the DMV to take them and make sure their IDs are updated, that they can vote. Um, make sure that the address matches to where you live. Make sure that that's the most important thing that you can do right now is to make sure that you're updated. But well, what will happen with the homeless people? Because when homeless people, when you register them to vote, and if it's questionable, they must draw a, a, a picture of where they live if it's on the bridge, regardless of where it is, and they, if they won't have an address. So how will that affect them? Have um, they been able to vote like that before? Well, what we would like is for everyone to be like accounted for. Like, we don't like to see people living on the bridge. You know, people should live into a homeless shelter or somewhere where they can call home so that if something should be mailed by the government, they should receive it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So the homeless shelter will be their address. Mm -hmm. well, I want to thank you so much for sharing this information with us about voter rights. And audience, I want to thank you, too, for being with us on Views with Joyce Waddell. I want you to tune in next week for another interesting program.